Live from the Fairmont Hotel in San Jose, California, it's The Cube at Big Data SV 2015. Welcome back everybody, this is Jeff Kelly, I'm with Wikibon and we are live on theCUBE at Big Data SV 2015 in San Jose. Uh, we're kicking off day three of coverage and we're, we're starting with the bang. We've got a great guest, Sunny Madra, who's a VP of Data Products at Pivotal joining us. Sunny, welcome to theCUBE. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so obviously there's been a lot of news announcements this week that we want to get to, but, but why don't we kind of level set. Tell us a little bit about uh, Pivotal, kind of the state of the, the big data business there, but also put in a little bit larger context because obviously Pivotal's also got the kind of the cloud component, yep. the application development component. Uh, give us an update on the business. Yeah, so 2014 was a really great year for us. You know, really, um, we, business really took off in a lot of different, uh, in all different aspects. And so when we look at, the data business, uh, we exited the business at $100 million in software bookings. And one of the big th uh, things that we did last year was we created uh, a, a product offering called the Big Data Suite. And we offer that in a subscription model. And that was a big change, because typically we had our products offered individually, we offered them with uh, perpetual licenses, and we switched to the subscription model. And that was really based on sort of looking at how our customers were using our products and how our customers were going on a particular journey, right? How they were going from, say, MPP to Hadoop and how they were layering on in-memory technologies. And our customers really wanted like a packaged offering around that. And so uh, of the 100 million, 40 million was of our subscription product, which we only launched in, in Q2 uh, two of last year. So we had a really strong business and, you know, kind of, the other thing that we saw together, in term, you know, looking at the question that you said about, you know, the Cloud Foundry business and our agile business is, you know, we really see customers following this following journey with us. And so that's, they work with our, you know, big data groups to capture information. They then engage our, you know, data science teams to look to get, gain some insight from the information that they're capturing and capturing either that in structured databases, on structured databases or in memory, right? Once they get that insight now, this is where Cloud Foundry and Pivotal Labs really come in. They take that insight and they can work to operationalize that in a data-driven application that they can run on Cloud Foundry. And so that's when, and, they can, and that can be built use, you know, with the help of Pivotal Labs. And so that's like the business is really coming together from all the way from the data all the way to you know, data-driven applications. Mm -hmm. So that's been really exciting for us. Yeah, so you guys really try to cover the, the whole spectrum from capturing the data, analyzing it for insight, and then operationalizing those insights in the form of applications. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so let's get to some of the news this week. A couple big announcements. The first one I wanted to talk about was the decision on Pivotal's part to open source your big data products, your suite of products. Yep. Both, um, that includes Greenplum, uh, Hawk, which is uh, your SQL on, Hadoop. SQL on Hadoop engine, Gemfire, and some other big data products. Talk about that. What, what was the decision? What was the, the um, internal discussions about that? And, and what was the impetus for that decision? Yeah, so, uh, you know, one, um, looking at the success that we had with Cloud Foundry. So, there was a, you know, we published some numbers on Cloud Foundry as well, and we had you know, real tremendous success last year. And looking, um, you know, having gone through that process, because, you know, that was a project that started inside VMware that then became, you know, open sourced, right? But looking at the success of commercializing that and building a community around it really gave us confidence that there is an ability to, you know, um, have soft, uh, open source software that has commercial ver distributions, and the, the business model is not just uh, support. Right, mm -hmm. and so by by having by seeing that unfold, it really gave us a confidence to embrace this larger industry trend, which is you know open source. And so the way I really think about that is one, you know, we're starting to see open source show up in RFP requirements, saying, is there an open source component to this? Right, is you know to the software that I'm buying, and that's because vendors don't want to be uh, customers don't want to be locked into vendors, and so that that's a big driving force. The second one, which again we saw in Cloud Foundry, is. You know, given the success of the large internet companies and then the new generation of companies, they, you know, when enterprises look at, this, look at those companies, how are these companies creating so much value quickly? And then when they kind of peel underneath the hood, they're saying, well, open source is there. Mm -hmm. But those companies are not just using open source software, they're creating open source software and they're contributing to open source software. So what we saw in Cloud Foundry is customers are buying the software from us but they're also showing up and working with us and saying, hey look, this is something on the roadmap for Cloud Foundry. You have it nine or 12 months out. I need it now, right? I, you know, I need to you know, solve this following business problem so that I don't get you know, leapfrogged by one of my competitors or a new upstart. And the way for them to do that is to get involved in the open source. 
And so that's a really big change that we're starting to see there where, you know, they're buying this offer and saying, hey, we want to send teams to also contribute so that we can get this feature done and accelerated or built the way we need it. Mm -hmm. And so that was a really big driving force um, that we saw, you know, in the Cloud Foundry project. And we've always had interactions with customers where we open up our roadmaps to them and we have let them have access to it, but never we never really allowed them to contribute. And then lastly, you know, the way I like to describe it is, if the three of us were starting a company today, and we wanted to solve a particular problem, you know, we'd go to the open source, right? We'd go right. and look for particular projects. And we look for those, pro like, look at those projects, we'd find the ones that had the most contributors and activity in the mailing list, and that's what we'd use to, you know, start building our company. Right, right. And so that's the new decision-making process, right? It's no longer that, you know, the idea from 30 years ago where we'd go and we, you know, find the big companies, call them up, get their data sheets, look at it and say, you know, who, right. it's, it's, it's open source. That's how we would go. And so we really want to embrace that trend. And, and, you know, the trend of, you know, people working on open source and bringing that software in also like internally, right? Mm -hmm. So we're like, like we kind of the shadow sales for us, right? Where, you know, somebody's working on it and say, I'm working on this really cool project. We should use this at work. So mm. those trends are just really big. For yeah, me. I think, you know, you hit on a few things that uh, I want to bring my co-host into the conversation, Jeff Frick, that Jeff, you and I were talking about on the intro is the way right. open source is changing, you know, not just the enterprise business from, from a vendor perspective, but also the way practitioners are, are developing so much of the of the value themselves <laughs> by, um, they're innovating within the open source projects themselves. Yeah. And that's really changing the business. Yeah, I'm just curious on the RFP. It's, a, it's an interesting example. When, when they're looking for open source, how many of those times do they already have experience in an open source component of what you're going to put in and they want to continue on that path? Or how much of it is, is you know they want to start to develop the expertise and become part of the community because they know they could potentially innovate faster along a different path or, or you know bring things to bear without necessarily having to wait for your guys roadmap to catch up to the requirements yeah so you know I think it's been a journey right I think the, f the first part of the journey was you know just embracing open source software and now we see that now like with Hadoop right, right enterprise right. are embracing Hadoop so that 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 was the first part of the journey that really you know broke open and now what we start seeing is that's why they you know the uh, purchasing departments want that in there right they're saying hey look we want the ability to have the flexibility not to be locked into any one vendor and have the ability for our teams to, you know, accelerate, right? If we, you know, and it's a good question for them to ask. If Do you really want to be buying proprietary software, right? Will this enable our business going forward? And so that's something that, you know, even like through the purchasing departments, procurement departments, they, they understand that they, they should ask that question because this will limit their business in a lot of yeah, ways. Yeah, and it's really too almost a reflection of more of an agile go to market exactly. methodology in the company, not software development, but just we don't know what we want all together now. Yep. Let's get going, get it in, and we want the ability to be able to move in real time and, and develop as well. Yep. Interesting that it's actually showing up in the RFPs. It, it, it is, and, and it's really, like I, you know, like I said earlier, it's all it's all being driven by what's happening in the consumer internet space, right? right? You know, you see a company like Uber, right, go to zero to you know forty billion dollars so quickly, and then you know you look back and say these guys, you know, they don't produce any physical good, they don't do anything mm -hmm. like that. It's all being done in software, right. right? And it's all really, you know, embracing new modes of customer engagement. And so, you know, one of the things that we really think, you know, going forward. Um, you know, data is driving that customer engagement model, and and so it's you know advertising and things like that. Those things, those things are going to change. It's really going to be about that. Con like you know, consumer internet companies really don't advertise. Uber doesn't advertise. They just give a really good experience to their user, right. and that really drives their business. And mm -hmm. so when other more traditional enterprises are looking at that, they're they're you know really seeing that this is the area that they have to invest in. It, it's interesting too your comment about the suite and subscription because we're in San Jose. You know, one of the biggest buildings in San Jose is Adobe. And you know they had very expensive products that you had to buy single licenses, and, and they flipped to the Creative Suite subscription model. Yep. And I think it's been transformative. And I think you said a huge portion of your reported numbers are coming through this kind of new methodology to buy. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about why that's more receptive. You know, what, how does this kind of map to their journey, and is well, that really it, the way to do yeah, it? Yeah, Adobe example is good, but it's exactly that, right? Customers are, you know, they're transforming, right? There's, you know, we're in this age of you know digital transformation, or a lot of things are changing. We're you know, we're kind of moving away from the offshoring, outsourcing model. Companies are realizing, like, you know, software's eating the world, right? right? And so they're really embracing, you know, agile development and bringing development on board. But as they need, as they do that, they need to have flexibility in the tools, right? So the challenge for them is if they buy a perpetual license for one product, and their business requirements change over six to nine months, they they don't want to have to show up and say, well, now I have to go buy another license for something. And that's why the subscription model, and then specifically the subscription model in a suite which is where we are with Pivotal, 
uh, big data suite is great for us, right? Where we end up giving the customers the flexibility to have, you know, structured data with, you know, uh, our Green Plum product, right? Unstructured in our Hadoop distribution, right? right. right? Um, you know, we offer, uh, you know, in memory with, with uh, Gemfire. What we've also added this year to the big data suite is we've also added um, Redis and RabbitMQ and a Cloud Foundry Foundation. So that really allows companies additional entitlements right. to not only do the data capture side of things, but also to move to operationalize right. that in applications. So you, you, That's the one piece that we didn't have in the last year, so yeah. now we've added that into the suite so yeah. we can kind of. So you've really flipped the sales and, and delivery methodology based on the way that they want to buy and their journey as opposed to trying to make them fit into what you've got to go sell. Well, yeah, ex exactly, right? And I think just, you know, as we see customers wanting to operationalize data, we can create data-driven applications, we don't want to have to have them keep coming back to say, look, mm -hmm. buy this suite from us. You can go from capturing data all the way to creating an application and you can, you know, move you can your licenses around as you need to. Yeah. So, so what are the implications on? implications for Pivotal's big data business from a revenue perspective. So if you're open sourcing a lot of the, the database, where, where are you going to monetize? Is it higher up the stack? How are you going to uh, tackle that? Yeah, good question. So, you know, like I said, again, leveraging Cloud Foundry for mm -hmm. us is we're going to have, you know, commercial distributions. And those commercial distributions will retain, um, you know, some enterprise functionality that, you know, uh, we only offer in, 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 the, um, um, in, the, in the commercial distributions. Mm -hmm. And so, um, when we think of the specific products like in Gemfire, right? So Gemfire, you know, we'll offer it open source, you know, the, all the product that we'll offer will be fully functional. But when you want something like, say, WAN replication or continuous querying technology, you know, that really for disaster recoveries or large clusters or across multiple data centers, that's the be of the functionality available in our mm -hmm. enterprise distribution. Similarly with our, um, you know, uh, our Hawk technology, you know, we have a next generation query optimizer, so we're going to put our current generation query, op query optimizer, mm -hmm. but our next one, we'll, we'll make that available in the uh, commercial distribution, and as we make the next next generation, we'll right. push that one into the open source. Very good. Um, so, of course, the other big news this week was the open data platform. Yeah. So, um, I've got several questions about that, yeah. but why don't you start with just telling us what it is. Yeah, so, you know, really, it's an industry collaboration. It's an initiative led by a number of folks. Uh, you know, we, we announced uh, on Tuesday, uh, there's about 15 people that have come in and we're getting more and more requests every day, so we're really excited about that. Really, you know, what we, what we saw in the, you know, in, with our customers and with potential customers, uh, we had a challenge where, or they, sorry, they were challenged where they were using, you know, multiple distributions from multiple companies in order to solve their business problems. And that was because, you know, there's a lot of fragmentation in the space. And the way I really like to think about it is, think of Unix before Linux, right? And so, you know, where you had a bunch of different companies that had their own distribution and the ecosystem of software was sort of, you know, moved slower because, it, you know, there was no standardization. Linux comes around, you get a common kernel, and then you get a situation where you have something like RHEL, CentOS, and Oracle Linux. And if your software runs on any one of them, it'll run on the other three, on the other two, right? And so that really enabled the ecosystem of software on Linux to grow in Linux to really mm -hmm. take off. And so, you know, looking at that, we felt as though there needed to be some standardization around a common core where, you know, a bunch of companies can agree upon creating a distribution from there. So it's not really about contribution, you know, as the, you know, some of the, the posts have come out this week. It's really just about saying, hey, let's agree to a common core and all build our distribution from there. ASF should continue to manage, you know, the contribution, the governance of those projects and the direction. We're just saying, let us pick these certain versions and all agree upon it together and then create our distributions from there. And I think that makes it better for the, you know, the, the customers buying the software. It makes it better for the ecosystem of developers creating software on top of Hadoop, you know, which I think this is one of the reasons we haven't seen that take off as much as it could. It's a challenge today, right, if you have to certify against three or four different vendors. Well, right, because as we've covered on theCUBE, Jeff, uh, the, the, where are all the big data applications is one of the questions we ask a lot. And there's, <laughs> there's, there's not too many companies out there that are focused on building those kind of applications. Is this an effort to kind of address that issue? Um, creating that common core so people can feel comfortable if I build an application on this distribution, I can move it to this dis that, that distribution, and do you think that will open up the big data application you, market? You hit it on the head, right? You see big data applications created today within you know companies, specifically within internet companies, because they don't have to fight the distribution war, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you're a, you know, if you're Facebook or something, you know, you're, you're, you have your, you know, own distro, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so then you can create a set of applications. You don't have to worry about it. But if you're an enterprise, you're, you know, you're buying different products from different folks or you have existing products, right? 
and you needed to integrate with this you know new data layer that you have and so exactly you know what was really what we want to accelerate we want to accelerate the ecosystem of software mm -hmm. that's being built on top of Hadoop which is you know it's there but it's not as big as it you know mm -hmm. we feel it could be well you mentioned fragmentation I wonder if you could give a couple of examples of what you mean by that um, I was reading a post by uh, Roman Shaposhnik who's your director of open source at Pivotal and he was mentioning something that he referred to as kind of mini ecosystems emerging around kind of the dis different distributions and I, I think that's what you're referring to around fragmentation could you kind of put add a little color to that what, what, what's some of the things you're seeing happening that you're hoping to, to, to overcome with the ODP yeah I mean you know first and foremost like you know we, we, when we we work with customers right we see customers you know running you know two to three different versions of HDFS within their enterprise right and that's you know, you have one, and, it, and how that, let's, let, it's really, you have to think about how that happens, right? So one group goes and, you know, decides to purchase, you know, distro A from a particular vendor, right? And that's really made it easy for the other group to, you know, probably purchase distro A, the, the you know, MSA is already in place, they can just right, go right. and say, hey, let's just expand mm -hmm. that contract. But what group B realizes, oh, we need this particular software, and that particular software is not certified on distro A. Mm -hmm. So, oh, I got to go get distro B, right? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, group C shows up and says, hey, you know what, I need this other thing and it's not certified on distro A or B, I need this other thing. And so, you know, you're, we're seeing, a, you know, and a lot of customers where customers are running multiple versions, mm -hmm. um, you know, not by design, but just by the fact of how the ecosystem is playing out right mm -hmm. now. And so, you know, we feel as if there's a common core you know, you wouldn't have that problem with that, you know, with these different groups choosing different So districts. we'll talk a little bit more about the relationship uh, the ODP will have with uh, the Apache Software Foundation and how, how the, what's the, what will that relationship be like? Because some of the criticism coming is that, well, we've got this group, a ASF, that, yeah. that, that is tasked with doing some of the things you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, how, will they, how will they interact? How do you view the relationship? Yeah, so, you know, one of the key things uh, with the, a it's very complimentary, right? But one of the key things that the ASF has done extremely well, and I think they need to continue to do that, ASF doesn't generally recognize vendors, right, or corporations. It's really around individual contributors, and I think that's the right thing, right? That's how the model works. That's how, you know, you contribute there. That's how the, you know, the, the um, you know, how you build, um, you know, your credibility within the ecosystem, right? Not just by being a big company, right? I think where that starts to have some challenges and where the ODP comes in and is complimentary, say, here, here's a bunch of companies that need to collaborate, not individual developers mm -hmm. on a particular project, right? To say, you know, so the developers can continue to collaborate on what the next generation of features are of, you know, for HDFS, right? But when three different vendors have to get together, you know, we have to say, well, look, we should all use this version x.y of HDFS in our distribution, right? And if we all do that, then the software that utilizes HDFS will, you know, be much easier to certify. So I think that's that complementary aspect mm -hmm. that you know we really bring to the ASF. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other interesting thing that I found about the open data platform is it's not just vendors selling software; it's practitioners as well. You've got GE involved. Uh, I think Verizon is one of yep. the initial members yep. as well. What role will practitioner organizations such as those play in well, the ODP? And, and that's that's by design, right? Mm -hmm. If it was just you know ven the vendors, we felt as though it wouldn't be. So the idea is that you know the the group of folks that make up the members are the ones that vote on the versions of the projects that need to be created and, and, and the, it also allows on what additional projects we want to bring to the core, right? We started with a small core today, HDFS, Yarn, MapReduce, and Ambari, but as we want to expand that, you know, that group will work together and that's why it's important to have the practitioners in there because they have their own views based on, you know, the problems that they're trying to solve. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so we're, we're running close on time, so I want to give you kind of the last word. What, so what's on the roadmap that, to the extent that you can share for, for both Pivotal, the ODP? I mean, what are you looking forward to in the next six, 12 months uh, in terms of what excites you? What do you think we'll be talking about maybe in, yeah. in next year at this table? Yeah, I think uh, really, you know, we're, you know, I have a lot of the teams focused as, as it, you know, the, really the integration of cloud and our data products mm -hmm. really and so that's that's been an area where I still think it's very early and we're you know we're gonna push there and so you're gonna see things coming out of us where you know much more you know I, I talked about a journey of you know a customer going from data capture to operationalizing it we really think that the data products enabled in Cloud Foundry will be really interesting for us so you'll start seeing a lot of that and that really starts to opening things up is as you, you know, have the ability to push the products out of, you know, sort of the EDW groups and into the, you know, line of business groups mm -hmm. to, you know, kind of really use those products uh, as Cloud Foundry makes yep. them available. Oh, I, I agree. I think that's yep. where it's going to get interesting is when you start to move these, start to operationalize big data yep. and you've got more business people making decisions on these kind of analytics. That's, that's where a lot, of, a lot of the value is that's, And that's where the ecosystem of applications will really start to, that, you know, where you're saying they're missing today, that's when they start coming. Great. And that's, and we're, yep. we're, I think we're all looking forward to that. Yep. So, <laughs> Sonny Mondra, VP of Data Products at Pivotal. Thanks 
so much for joining Thanks. us on the Cube. All right. We appreciate it. Thanks everybody for watching. Stick around. We'll be right back with our next segment live here in San Jose.